coming up from the Northeast Live Studios in Guwahati. Northeast tonight with Wasbi Rusan. Welcome to Notice Tonight, the show that decodes the region. The center is all set to name former IB Special Director Aksaya Kumar Mishra as the new interlocutor for the Naga Peace Talks. Unless there is a slip between the cup and the lip, Aksaya Mishra will come to replace RN Ravi as the Naga Peace interlocutor. Ravi has since been transferred out as the governor of Tamil Nadu. The decision to have Mishra as the new interlocutor means that New Delhi is in favor of separating the governor of Nagaland from that of the interlocutor, contrary to the dual charge that Ravi was holding. This development comes at a time when a key stakeholder of the Naga peace process, the NSCNIM, had openly been demanding Ravi's replacement as interlocutor. The other big development in so far as the protracted Naga peace process is concerned is the coming together of all political parties in Nagaland to be part of an oppositionless government in the state to lend a fillip to the peace dialogue. To discuss these developments and more, I'm joined from Kohima by a well-known academic and advisor of the Naga Mothers Association, Dr. Rosemary Zuvitsu. BJP national spokesperson Monlimo Kikon is also with me in Kohima. Joining me as well is Mr. Iluandang, the general secretary of the Naga Ho. Also with me is Teza Terry, leader of the Naga Tribes Council. Joining me from New Delhi, and I have Mr. Kekia Sema, a former IAS officer and a commentator. Uh, gentlemen and lady, welcome to Notice tonight. I'll first go to you, uh, Dr. Rosemary Zovitsu. Uh, two big developments as far as the Naga uh, Peace Theater, if I may use the word, is concerned. Uh, uh, Dr. Rosemary, we have a new interlocutor. The name is almost finalized, only uh, as we understand, only a formal announcement is uh, being awaited. That is Akshay Kumar Mishra, the former, the former special director in the Intelligence Bureau, is going to be the new Naga Peace interlocutor. Uh, and on the other hand, the 60-member assembly does not have an opposition. That has been finalized. And a meeting on the 18th of September is going to prepare the modalities. Now, Dr. Rosemary, first of all, how would you see the announcement of a new interlocutor? in the offing as far as the Naga peace process is concerned? Um, Wasbir, I think uh, this is a very good development and interesting, uh, unexpected development for many. But I think for Naga civil societies, it's very, very important that we are going to have a new interlocutor who's going to lead the way forward, hopefully towards a peace accord and the beginning of a settlement. And the very fact that we now have an oppositionless government, it definitely shows how serious our state politicians are also now for resolving the decades old Naga problem. For all of us who are gathered here this evening, I think it is equally important that we discuss and look forward to the days ahead leave aside whatever grievances has happened. And you will also be aware, this evening, the Nagaland state government is bidding farewell to the governor and the interlocutor, Mr. R. N. Ravi. We wish him the best. And I'm very sure in the coming days, we will definitely see positive development now, towards peace. Now, doc Dr. Rosemary, uh, what will be the challenges, uh, in your view, that the new interlocutor, Akshay Mishra, could face? You see, Wasbir, A.K. Mishra is not new to the Naga issue. 
He's actually been one of the key persons who has been uh, deputed by the Prime Minister to have interactions with the NSC and IM for quite some time. I think the fact that he has been in touch with this major group, uh, he probably will not have uh, many difficulties in communicating with them. The important factor we need to keep in mind is the seven NNPGs that are supposed to have uh, finished all discussions and ready with their agreed position. Hopefully we will have Mr. Mishra coordinating at least the joint sitting and understanding between these different groups before an accord is signed. Right. Uh, Mr. Teza Terry, uh, leader of the Naga Tribes Council, joining me from New Delhi. Mr. Teza Terry, uh, you know, the, as Dr. Rosemary has said, and we also know uh, that the NNPGs, the seven member NNPGs, they have, they said that they have ended their discussions. Uh, they have arrived at uh, what is called the agreed position. Uh, now, do you think uh, the biggest challenge as far as Akshaya Mishra, the new interlocutor, will have is to bring the two groups together, that is the NSC and IM and the NNPGs, sit across the table and resolve the differences. Because the NSC and IM has said that the issues are not resolved at all, because they cannot sign without a flag and the constitution for the Nagas. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Wasbir, thank you for having me again. Uh, this we have been discussing again and again. And uh, yes, under the leadership of uh, interlocutor of uh, Mr. Arend Ravi, the talk have been brought to a very high level, advanced level, and good level of understanding have been reached. And we are only waiting for agreement to be signed. And now, if A.K. Misra comes, he will only be taking over from where it has stopped. So I don't think there will be any difficulty, any problem. Mr. A.K. Uh, Misra is one person who knows the North is in and out, and he knows the uh, Nagas very well, more than any of us. So I believe the process will uh, smoothly continue and he will be able to bring the process to a logical conclusion. That is our expectation. Right. Uh, we, we hope uh, things reach a logical conclusion sooner than later. That is what every Naga uh, would definitely like, and also people like us, us closely observing the Naga peace process for so long. Uh, let me turn to you, Mr. Eluwandang, before coming to Mr. Keke Sema. Uh, Mr. Eluwandang, uh, you know, the NSC and IM has been, had been openly demanding uh, a change in the interlocutor. They did not want RN Ravi anymore. Uh, now, do you think uh, NSC and IM will be a uh, little bit relaxed in their positions? Do you think they are likely to be more accommodative uh, to Mr. Akshay Mishra? What is your assessment? Yeah. Uh... I think uh, since last August, uh, while uh, Mr. A.K. Mistra was the IB chief, they have been having informal talks. I think a lot of uh, misunderstandings between the government of India and the NSC and I in district has been cleared. Uh, I'm sure. There should be, they should be relaxed and should be comfortable. So you think it will be relaxed and comfortable, but what is your uh, assessment? Do you think that because the NNPGs, the seven member NNPGs uh, did not have much of a problem with Mr. Mm -hmm. R.N. Ravi. Uh, so going by that, do you think uh, the NNPGs will also be comfortable with Mr. Akshay Mishra? What, what do you think? Absolutely. Uh, all the parties should be comfortable and should, we should uh, post confidence on the leadership. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 
turning to you, Mr. Kekia Sama, former administrator, now, of course, a very close observer of the Naga peace process and a well-known commentator. Uh, Mr. Kekia Sama, uh, how important do you think the role of the interlocutor going to be? Because for the last two years or so, uh, at least on the surface, Mr. R. N. Ravi was not seen to be doing much as far as the peace process was concerned. And it was almost in some kind of a deadlock after the October uh, you know, 2019, when everybody thought that the discussions had ended. Uh, and after that, it was left to the Intelligence Bureau and certain other leaders in the government of India to keep talking and keep the process on. Uh, so how important do you think will be the role of the new interlocutor? Well, I think uh, his role is no less as has been for the interlocutor in this case. Now, as a new, <clears throat> new entry into the fray, I believe that uh, Mr. Ike Mishra, whether he has had intensive interaction with the national workers, I am or otherwise, we need to have some other perspectives broadly in mind and which I hope that the government of India will keep in mind. It is a fact that NSCNIM has been more or less the chief negotiator. As much as the seven working groups have been negotiating the one point that has to be put on board is the fact that while they are negotiating for the greater welfare of the people, the people themselves are still kept in the dark, meaning that the NSC and IM, what they are demanding from the what is called the competency clauses. These are never revealed to the people. It is kept a secret from the people, and we don't know exactly what are the contents of those competency clauses. Now they may say that they have the endorsement of the stakeholders. The real stakeholders are the people. That is the majority. And if the NSCNI keeps the competency clauses uh, on transparent uh, content, you see, that is unfair to the people that they are supposed to be negotiating for. And therefore, it would be a very important responsibility on the part of Mr. Ek Mishra, if he becomes the interlocutor, to assess the real mood of the people apart from what the negotiating teams of national workers are saying to them. Right. There are a, there are a great many contents in the uh, competency clauses that the Nagas are still not aware of. And okay. if we are to take cognizance of the fact that NSC and IAM is insisting on issues such as the pan naga ho ho that is detrimental to the state of Nagaland and the people of Nagaland. And therefore, unless the competency clauses that NSC and IM is proffering is made transparently clear, I think 
the whole negotiation being concluded with that without that assessment of the right. people's I will, real sentiment Mr. Sema, is going to be Ms. a problem. Mr. Sema, I'll come back to you, but you have made some very, uh, very, very points. You have made some very significant points. Uh, I'll take a response from Dr. Rosemary Zuvitsu. Uh, Dr. Rosemary, you have heard uh, Mr. Keke Sema is saying uh, that, you know, one of the biggest challenges before the new interlocutor, if Mistra takes over, that is, uh, will be to discuss with the NSC and IM, because Mr. Sema is saying that NSC and IM is keeping, keeping some of the competency clauses that it is referring to a secret, and that they are not telling the people on whose behalf they are actually negotiating. Uh, now, the, and he has also said that the Pan Naga Ho Ho idea of the NSC and IM is not quite a good idea. It could be detrimental. So how do you respond to this? Um, Wasveer, I think I would disagree a bit on these issues with Mr. Kekia here. We need to remember that the competencies that are being talked about, the elements of the framework agreement, there have been a series of consultations with Naga leaders, leaders of civil societies, where a lot of these have been shared with the leaders who have attended. If the rest of the people don't know about it, it's probably because it has not been disseminated because we have also seen the deadlock and the issues that have cropped up during the time of uh, Mr. R.N. Ravi. So uh, for Mr. A.K. Mishra, even the competencies would not be a secret at all because he is privy to whatever is being discussed representing the Prime Minister's office for quite some time. The GNF women delegation met him last year. We've had an interaction with him and we are well aware of the knowledge that he has regarding the Naga crisis. As far as the pan Nago ho, ho is concerned, we must remember that this is not a new concept. If you look at other countries, for example, the Sami parliament, you have the Samis living in different countries, but you have their parliament where representatives and members come together and talk about the welfare, protection of their culture and of their rights as a forum. From what we see regarding the proposal of the pan Nagahoho, it is almost along similar lines where representatives of all our tribes it won't be every Tom, Dick and Harry coming in. I'm very sure it'll be tribes representing all of us who will be there in that Apex Forum, who will be talking about our cultural rights, our social rights, our political rights. And I'm very sure this is going to be a very important uh, platform. Uh yes, there have been debates, especially with Nagas of Nagaland, who have really not understood the the um, the idea of what this pan Nagohoho really means. But at the end of the day, we need to remember that the Naga struggle is to make a common homeland for all Nagas across borders. We have Nagas in Nagaland, in Manipur, in Assam, Arunachal, and in the parts of Myanmar. And these all divisions by artificial boundaries. What kind of a Naga future are we looking forward to? We are looking towards a future where Nagas can live as one in a homeland that we can call our own. And therefore, how can we segregate our people across borders and say we are from this state and they are from that side? I, I think at this rate, this is the 21st century. We have seen movements of self-determinations across the world. We have seen movements of indigenous peoples across the world. And I think Nagas are at a threshold where we have to decide, do we want to exist with India side by side as a people, or do we again want to live in small segments right. divided by artificial boundaries? Right. Now, this brings me to the question, uh, Mr. Elu and Dang, you, you represent the Naga Hoho. Uh, do you think that the idea mm -hmm. of a pan Naga Hoho is coming at this stage? Because the Naga Hoho, 
which you represent, nothing personal. I'm just trying to understand. Uh, nothing personal. I'm not just trying to understand. And that is why I want you to explain. Do you think the idea of a pan Naga Ho Ho has come because the Naga Ho Ho has failed to live up to the expectations of the Naga people? Because there is already the Sumi Ho Ho, there is already the uh, uh, various tribes have their Ho Ho's, and you are supposed to be having the apex Naga Ho Ho. But even now, Despite that, we are now talking, or we are now hearing of a pan Naga Ho Ho. Do you think the Naga Ho Ho has not really succeeded in addressing the hopes and aspirations of the Naga people? Yeah, was well, let my see my audio is full of echo. It's not comfortable to talk. I hear only my own voice. If that can be corrected. We can hear you. Please carry on. We can hear you clearly. Please carry okay. on. Yeah, because of the connection, I was not, I, would, I, couldn't, I could not follow the other panelists for last maybe about five minutes or so. Anyway, Naga people, we are a struggling people. The movement is all. They eat in the form of Naga political groups or civil societies or public, every Naga is a part of this movement. And in this, there are certain ups and downs that we cannot avoid it. Yeah, it. Uh, in regards to Pan Naga Ho Ho, Naga people have been expressing its aspiration, desire to live together under one administration, the struggle is on, and therefore the formation, the coming in of uh, Pan Nagahoko will tell us in its own time. And regarding Nagahoko, yes, we have been giving our best as human beings an error issue, so failures could be there. No one is perfect. But as addition is one, we will continue to pursue our aspiration collectively. Absolutely. No one can put a check. No one can control people's aspirations, and they're well justified. Aspirations are justified at the end of the day. As a, as a nation, India is an aspirational nation, and so are the Nagas. Uh, let me go to you, Mr. Tezar Terry. You have heard Mr. Kekia Sema a, 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 a short while ago. He's basically talked about the competency clauses, and he said that the NSC and I am is not really telling the people as to what uh, what uh, what is there in the competency clauses. And uh, that is something which uh, he has commented. And Mr. Sama has also said that a pan Naga Ho Ho idea uh, may not be a great idea at the end of the day. So how do you respond? What do, how do you uh, assess the situation? Yeah, to me, I agree with uh, Mr. Kekie. And the CNIM have to be transparent. They have to be pragmatic. And they have to reflect the people's aspiration. And there's no compromise about Naga political aspiration. But at the moment, in absence of Naga integration, the question of Ben Naga Ho Ho with a statute from the parliament it is rejected by the people very clearly. If we do want to have a pen Nagahoho, we will have, we will decide collectively, but it cannot be from the statute of the parliament. Okay, but uh, Dr. Rosemary, uh, you know, Mr. Teza Terry is saying that, you know, since there is, uh, in, without any Naga integration, there cannot be a pan Naga Ho Ho. But, but, you know, Nagas are spread, as you said, in different parts of the neighborhood, 
in Nagaland, in Assam, mm. Arunachal Pradesh, in Manipur, and also across the international border in Myanmar. Uh, so can there be a boundaryless Pen Naga Ho Ho or not? Of course, of course. Because you see, no matter what criticism is being put on the Naga Ho Ho, the very concept of the Naga Ho Ho has been very similar to what we are talking about, the Pan Naga Ho Ho, where we already have representatives from Arunachal, from the Naga Ho Ho, from the uh, Naga people in Assam, in the southern part of uh, Manipur, in the Naga Hills. And you also have representatives and affiliations with the Myanmar Nagas in Myanmar. You know, so and of course, including Nagaland. So there's no reason why Naga tribes should have a rethink when an accord is uh, at our door of unifying our people at least through such a system where our leaders, the tribe leaders, these will be the tribe leaders sent by different tribes who will be sent to the Pan Naga Ho Ho the very concept of the Naga Ho Ho. And no. therefore, I see in the days ahead, it is very important for the tribes also to strengthen the Naga Ho Ho. Because no. as you said, there are some tribes who have gone away from the Naga Ho Ho. I think there are a lot of underlying efforts that are going on from various tribes also. The importance of strengthening the Naga Ho Ho again and no. building up I'm, this structure for us. No, I'm coming to Mr. Keki Asama, but Dr. Rosemary, a little clarification there. You see, you, you have the various tribal Ho Ho's, then you already have the Naga Ho Ho. We have Mr. Elwan Dang mm. representing the Naga Ho Ho at this, in this discussion mm. tonight. Mm. Now you are mm. talking about a pan Naga Ho Ho. Do you think mm -hmm. there will be, do, don't you think there will be duplication? How different is the pan Naga Ho Ho going to be from the Naga Ho Ho which is existing at the moment? Not really, uh, Wasbir, but there definitely will be a difference because as of now, you don't have the Naga Ho Ho with the kind of powers and functions uh, which we anticipate the pan Naga Ho Ho to have. I think the very fact that if a pan Naga Ho Ho is acceptable to the government of India, we will see it as an independent structure with a, a lot of autonomy and a lot of perhaps even funding for the kind of development that can be taken for all the Naga areas. So, uh, Mr. Kekia Sama... Which the Naga Ho Ho doesn't have now. Right. Uh, Mr. Kekia Sama, when you said, when you said, when you said that the pan Naga Ho Ho could be detrimental, uh, what did you mean? Could you, could you elaborate a bit? Because uh, a lot of people seem to think, at least Dr. Rosemary on the show tonight, seems to think, as so also is Mr. Elwandang, that uh, you know, if you have a pan Naga Ho Ho, if the government of India agrees to that, that can work for the welfare of the Nagas all across the neighborhood. Uh, so, but you said it is going to be detrimental. Would you explain <clears throat> a little bit? I think uh, we need to get some facts clearly in our vision before we start commenting profusely appreciating it. Number one, the parliament would violate Article 371A because they say that Pan Naga Ho Ho will be a cultural body, only cultural body, and will be a statutory body because it will be created through the Act of Parliament. Now, the Parliament, under the Article 371A, has no jurisdiction on issues of cultural body being created through an Act of Parliament. It is a state subject. So the people will make a pen naga ho ho or unmake it. It is not for Indian Parliament to create it. So that is the first point. Number two, it is supposed to be a statutory authority with advisory role in the initial stage. But NSC and I am now demands that the Pan Naga Ho Ho 
should have a mandatory authority over all the Naga territories, meaning what NSC and IM is doing now clandestinely, controlling the government system in Nagaland, in Manipur, in Arunachal, or even in Assam, they want to recreate the present control system over the statutory authority that is the state elected government. If our members here in discussion know, according to the NSC and IM, Pandaga Ho Ho will have the authority to nominate members in the upper house, whether it is 60, 60%, 70%, even that they are not telling the people how many members will Pan Naga Ho Ho have as a representative in the upper house. The other thing that they have structured is even if the lower house the elected body of our people want to pass a bill, it will not become an act until it is approved by the upper house, which is the stronghold of Pan Naga Hoho nominated representative. Right. It's a way of controlling the whole system. Now, how does two statutory authorities work within the same frame. So here, government of India must understand that parliament cannot enact a bill or an act that creates a statutory body if it is supposed to be only a cultural body. Right. Number uh, two is no. Pan Naga Ho Ho having that I'll have to supreme kind of authority to control the actual statutory, statutory elected representatives decisions i think we're going to have chaos okay okay That's i'll 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 have to stop you i'll i'll i'll, I'll have to uh, stop you because all for only reason that i'm going for a break but when i come back I will get a response to this statement by these comments or analysis uh, by Mr. Kekia Sema from Dr. Rosemary Juvizu, Thesa Terry, and Mr. Elwan Dang. Don't go away. I'll be right back. Okay, welcome back. I'll go straight to you, Mr. Elu and Dang. Uh, Mr. Elu and Dang, you heard uh, Mr. Kheki Sema yes. saying that, yes. you know, the Pan Naga Ho Ho idea, uh, you know, that could be one of the challenges of the new interlocutor. We are discussing what could be the challenges of the new interlocutor. I have named the show tonight Naga Peace Hope. But if the NSC and I insist that there has to be a Pan Naga Ho Ho, and as Mr. Kekia Sama said that it is, he has, uh, his uh, view is that the, uh, the NSC and IM's idea of a pen Naga Ho Ho, they will be able to nominate as many people as possible in the upper house. And, you know, no act should become law, no bill should become an act unless it is approved by the upper house. And if the upper house is in control of the people by the pen Naga Ho Ho, things could be difficult. It could be an attempt. Uh, at a, to take control of the entire system. That is what Mr. Kekia Sema has said. Uh, what would be, how would you like to see this? See, uh, in the first place, I heard Professor Rosemary talking about Pan Nagao, the idea of Pan Nagao. 
I agree by what you say. Number two, uh, argument put forth by Sema. I think we are talking things on presumptions too much. Nagal as Naga people struggle is to have one administration. What is the harm if Naga people express its desire to come together and live as a people? And what is why? Why should we be talking about act of parliament in Delhi? Let us talk about solution. Let solution agreement come. Let us decide what is best for our people. Till such time, I think it is premature to even question each other. We have, none of us are privy to the talk, but all of us are concerned that something beneficial for the people emerges out of it. Right. But on assumptions, we, if we have to debate, I think we are heading nowhere. So right. Practical. We need to be realistic. Right. Now, uh, Mr. Teza Thiri, I am coming to you, Dr. Rosemary Juvitsu. Uh, Mr. Teza Thiri, you know, the civil society, as as Mr. Eluandang has just said, we are all concerned. But the civil society is not privy to the talks. The civil society is not directly privy to the talks, and that is the problem. Uh, you know. Now, now, now you are talking about the pan Naga Ho Ho. Mr. Eluandang is saying that what is the problem because the Nagas need one administration. But Mr. Khekia Sema is saying that cultural affairs is not under the purview of the parliament, that it is, it is a state subject. Do you think all these things are going to delay what everybody is waiting for, a final solution to the Naga problem? I, I, I. Voice there. Okay, uh, we have lost Voice. that line. We will we'll come to Teza Thari once again. We'll Hello. come to Teza Thari once again. But uh, Dr. Rosemary Juvi, so the same question goes to you. Uh, now, you know, Mr. KKSMI is saying that parliament has no jurisdiction over cultural affairs. It is a state subject. Uh, he's saying that, uh, you know, uh, Pan Naga Ho Ho, uh, we, if, if that becomes a reality, uh, you know, it will be able to nominate n an unspecified number of people to the upper house, and then it can control affairs, it can control the system. And he is raising this question, how can you have two systems, one elected by the people, that is the elected government, and other nominated by the Pan Naga Ho Ho, will control the upper house if it comes into being? Dr. Rosemary. Um, see, Wasbir, I think the interesting part of the Naga peace process and hopefully an accord is that it's going to be different from many other systems that we have seen. I'm very sure the government of India is perusing for quite some time the demands put forward by the different groups. I do not want to state that we are privy to everything but almost a large population of our Nagas are aware of what kind of negotiations are going on. At the end of the day, it is going to be the voice of the people that is going to be equally important. And it will be the people who will also elect whoever is to be elected into the tribes and into the different bodies to be representative of the people. It will not be an armed group alone that will be doing so. We must also remember that we also have seven Naga political groups waiting on the sidelines. The accord definitely will be a meeting point of these different groups. And therefore, I really don't want to stand on the idea that uh, such, a, such a unity of Nagas across borders and boundaries for the protection of our rights, whether it be social or cultural, or even political for that matter, that is what the whole struggle is about. 
And if we're only talking about the Nagas of Nagaland, what kind of a Naga future for the Naga people are we envisioning? I think when we talk of Naga, the Naga movement and patriotism, anyone who talks only about one particular state, one particular area, definitely it is not understanding the whole process of what this whole struggle is okay. about. Now, now Teza Terry, uh, if you can hear me now, uh, Dr. Rosemary is saying that what is the point if we only think about the Nagas of Nagaland? Because the Nagas around Nagaland uh, are also, they also have aspirations and so on. But don't you think this brings us to the, back to square one? Because the NSC and IM movement started with uh, integration of the Naga inhabited areas into one administration under one umbrella. And now uh, NSC and IM, at some point there was a feeling that the NSC and IM has given up their demand for integration. And now uh, you are talking about integration through a different uh, formula that is the mm -hmm. Pan Naga Ho Ho. Uh, do you think uh, things are back to square one? Do you think that will delay the possible solution to the peace process? Uh, what is your take? Was there, I don't think so. <clears throat> it cannot derail. The fact remains, when the negotiation started, if I can recollect, the interlocutor clearly mentioned that our negotiation will be based on truth, a brutal truth, the truth to the extent of hurting each other. But we must hammer out a solution, the best solution. Here we are talking about territory. We are talking about political. The people coming together without land. The people coming together without its territory. Nagaland, we have, we, we have enough experience of multiple government. As of today, we have 12 government. Uh, and uh, including the state government, we have 12 government. So we cannot allow one government to control another government, one structure to control another structure. Th there cannot be two political power. For that matter, it is very clear, without integration, this pen Ho with uh, statutory power from the parliament, it is not possible. But what is possible is Nagahoho is possible. Right. Nagas have every right to be united under any nomenclature or an, under any structure. Okay. We don't need to parliament to pass an act for us to become a, All right. a uh, Nagahoho. All right. Late in this discussion, we are joined by Mr. Monlumo Kikon, the national spokesperson of the BJP. Uh, an important party leader in Nagaland. Mr. Monlumo Kikon, we are discussing uh, the possible appointment of Akshay Mishra as the new interlocutor of the Naga peace process. The other development as far as the Naga peace process is concerned is the near finalization of the opposition-less government idea. You are having a meeting on the 18th of September. That is two to three days from now. The BJP, the NDPP, and the NPF is going to have a meeting to give a final shape to the opposition-less government. How do you respond, first of all, to the possible appointment of a new interlocutor? Do you think that is a ray of hope? Do you think the new interlocutor will be able to break the deadlock? Waspir, once again, thank you for inviting me to your show. I was a little late because I was attending the farewell program organized by the government of Nagaland um, to bid farewell to R.N. Raviji. 
And coming straight to your question, I would also like to remind you that uh, that there have been several interlocutors in the past. And for more than uh, two decades, the discussion have been uh, held by uh, the various interlocutors uh, appointed. I think that uh, the appointment of uh, uh, new interlocutors from time to time uh, arose out of uh, various reasons. And uh, this has been a practice in the past. So whether uh, anybody is appointed as an interlocutor or, or not is not the primary question. The, the primary question is that uh, the negotiations will continue where uh, the previous interlocutor uh, leaves. And hence, uh, the new interlocutor who will come will work on the basis of uh, the past uh, uh, experience and also the position which have, uh, not the position, but at least uh, the, the situation which has uh, uh, been left uh, by the, various, uh, the previous uh, interlocutor. So, um, Government of India has various agencies which engages in uh, uh, many levels of discussions. Uh, the main negotiation is conducted by the interlocutor, however, and... Uh, so, what will, be, what will be the new interlocutor's challenges? Mr. Any... Kikon, Mr. Kikon, what will be, what according to you, will be the challenges of the new interlocutor? Obviously, the first challenge is to take the talk forward and to restart uh, the discussion uh, where uh, the previous interlocutor or in this case R.N. Ravi has left the dis uh, talks. So I think uh, the first challenge would be to uh, address some of the pressing issues that have been raised by both sides. Right. And, and to what extent, to what extent, and to what extent will be the opposition-less government, the 60 legislators rising above political affiliations and, uh, you know, forming a government without any opposition in the 60-member state assembly? Uh, do you think that is only symbolic? A lot of people say that it is only a symbolic exercise. Well, many people will have their own point of view. If there is no opposition-less government, people will say, why don't you unite? When there is opposition-less government, people will say, why are you having uh, opposition-less government? Uh, <clears throat> so I think the question that needs to be asked is, to what extent the intent and also the uh, participation of the legislators and also uh, different political parties towards uh, the peace process. So when this question arises, it is very clear that they is a united approach or there is a show of unity in ensuring that uh, the legislators representing the people wants uh, a solution that is not uh, hasty but hammered out for a lasting solution right i am i am unfortunately i'm running absolutely short of time May, very quickly final comments uh, mr keki sama uh, very quickly 30 seconds uh, what is your final comment how would you like to conclude look in as far as i'm concerned the opposition less government issue is just a political gimmick nothing more nothing less their unity can be shown even as an opposition member where the agenda or the issue concerned. They all agree to uphold it. That is the consolidation that they need. But by way of destroying democracy and make the whole state a corruptive system unchecked by anybody because there is no opposition. 
is a big disservice to the people, as far as I'm concerned. Right. We will, we will have to, Mr. Sema, we'll have to, we'll have to wait and watch. We'll have to wait and watch, but we'll have to also give the people's representatives a chance uh, to contribute their bit, because at the end of the day, they are elected by the people. But yes, uh, we'll have to keep a close watch, as you say, because you have expressed a cautionary note there. Mr. Elu and Dang, 30 okay, seconds. Can I just intervene. Waspir, can I? Very quickly, 30, 20 seconds. Yes, Monlumo. Please, please. Can I just intervene? I think it is presumptuous to say it is it is presumptuous to say that, that uh, forming an oppositionless government is against democracy. I mean that is a very weird understanding of the meaning of democracy. I feel that every individual and every leader must contribute positively, and any approach, whether it is by a social worker or a political party leader or a elected representative, towards. Exec towards supporting a uh, possible solution is a positive approach. And I think that uh, uh, right. picking on a process and picking on a democratic process instead of focusing on the objective of a solution, I think is, uh, is uh, disappointing. And okay. I feel that with due respect to everyone, I think everyone is contributing. Right. We, we, and we'll you have will to, see we'll that have to, in the we'll future, to, in we'll the days to, to come, that, once the uh, opposition we'll to, government is... We'll have to keep it at that only for the lack me, of time, Monlumo. Uh, Elu and Dang, 30 seconds to your final comments. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah, we have had so much debate over the previous interlocutor. Now the new interlocutor has been appointed by the government of India. Let us once push up, strengthen the hands of the interlocutor and also the negotiators collectively so that the very aspiration that we have been talking about will be achieved at right. the earliest. Right. Very well, well said, uh, well said, Elwin Dang. Uh, he said that it is time to strengthen the hands of both the interlocutor as well as the negotiating groups. Tezateri, final comments, quickly. Mutual admiration, no? Okay, Tezateri, final comments to, from you. Teza, final yeah, comments. Presently, no political parties will take a stand. No political party will take a stand. And we will all conveniently walk together without taking our stand. We are going through a mutual ad admiration society. And this will take us nowhere. As far as political negotiation is concerned, two and a half decades is enough for any solution to be hammered out. We want our negotiators to be pragmatic, and they have to be realistic. And if they have any problem, Come back to the people. After all, it is the people who will decide, not the negotiators. Very strong comments uh, from Teza Terry there. The oppositionless government is a mutual administra ad admiration society. And you said that the negotiators have to be pragmatic. And if they cannot hammer out a solution, which they have not been able to do in the last two and a half decades, come to the people. Uh, that is what Teza Terry has said. Last word to the lady, uh, Dr. Rosemary Zuvitsu. Waspir, I really want to be optimistic. We appreciate the government and the elected legislators who have joined hands to take the peace process forward. Nagaland is at a, the Nagas, for that matter, are at a critical juncture. And any, any kind of partnership, especially from elected legislators, will create a difference. There's already a lot of developments happening, and uh, we are positive. We are looking forward to at least an accord being signed in the coming days. Absolutely. There is no doubt, viewers, that there is optimism around. But at the same time, the sharp views, uh, sharp divisions uh, within the Naga society uh, on as, as far as the approach to the peace process is concerned. The division is not for the Naga aspirations. As far as the Naga aspirations are concerned, everybody is united. But approach to reach a solution, there are differences. No one can deny that. But we will have to hope that uh, the new negotiator and the opposition-less government in the state, both combined together, will be able to resolve, able to bridge the divide and take the peace process forward, leading 
to an acceptable and honorable solution to the protracted Naga peace process or to the protracted Naga political problem. I thank all my panelists for participating in this discussions and the viewers for watching the show. Good night and goodbye.